Hello and welcome to our latest edition of Bulldogs Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. And this is a very special one indeed, because for the second time on this program, we have the great Steve Gearham back with us. G'day, mate. How are you, mate? I'm well, thanks. And today is going to be a very special show in a sense, because we talked about the impact on Steve's life of that famous try in the 1980 grand final. What we didn't get a chance to talk about that day was the enormous slice of Bulldogs history leading up to that try. In the late 70s, up to the 80s, and of course, beyond that, Steve's career continued. And we'll talk about that as well. But there was a huge amount of build-up to that 1980 grand final, which was a breakthrough grand final victory for the Bulldogs. So that's the main focus of today's Bulldogs Unleashed with Steve Gearan. Betting takes you away from the action. It can distract you from footy's most exciting moments. Don't let a bet take you away from the match. Reclaim the game. Be gamble aware. Let's talk about the dog days. So now let's talk about this remarkable career and there's so much that we didn't get to cover last time because the build-up to that moment that we discussed, Steve, we talked about the impact on your life after the 1980 grand final try, but let's go right back. Starting out to when you were, you know, a, a junior playing rugby league and how you were scouted by the Bulldogs and why. Yeah, um, I was actually a Newdown junior and um, and played SG ball for Newtown, and, but I went to Christian Brothers Lewisham. Um, and played all my footy there and they used to play on a Saturday and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, um, it, I got to year 12 and, and we got to the, the state knockout final and played uh, Patricia Brothers Fairfield and I was playing Flewisham. Anyway, we, we had a good day on the day and I had a good and I had a good, pl- a good good game on the day and through the course of it all and after the game, uh, Bullfrog um, in his way, of course, he, he did all the scouting at the time too, I suppose, a lot of it. And um, he um, approached mum and dad and... Um, and said, oh, you know, we, we really like him to play um, for Canterbury next year. We're willing to give him a scholarship to go to Teachers College, and which I, you know, which I eventually took up. But the irony of that was um, on the day, I, I, I followed Newtown most of my life, well, all my life was a kid, went to Henson Park and sat on the hill and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, I was, I was really quite keen to sort of go into grade and try and um, play for Newtown. Anyway, um, I said to Dad prior to, you know, accepting whatever – you know, can we talk to Frank Farrington? He was the, the head of That's Newtown right. at the time. Yeah. Anyway, we uh, we went and saw him because sort of dad sort of knew him because he great friends of ours with Bobby Witt and Bobby Witt was a, a famous halfback in mm-hmm. Newtown. He was a great friend of the family. Anyway, so we made the contact and uh, we went and saw Frank and cut a long story short, um, Frank said, oh, he's too small, he'll never make it, you know. So anyway, so that was a bit shattering for me. <laughs> anyway, so we only had one option then and I don't think Bullfrog knew about that one anyway. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, we we made contact and, and Bullfrog uh, signed me up and off I went to Teachers College and, um, yeah, and my career kicked off there in the under-23s in 1975. What was that first conversation with Bullfrog like? I mean, you hear so many stories about the families and the players that he brought into the club. What, what was it like talking to him in those days? What was he like? Oh, it was, it was a pretty co- quick conversation, but he and Dad were a good friends through the CYA. Right. And um, through the years... Uh, because so Louis Hume, that area sort of thing, um, and yeah, so yeah, Bullfrogs, mum and dad sort of knew him pretty well, uh, and it, and yeah, it was that's just the connection there. But he, it was short and sweet, pretty much, and um, and yeah, that was the early days. I think George was one of the first ones that were the scholarships, and I and I was probably in the next group. There wasn't too many after that. I think the used boys might have been on like a scholarship, and Bullfrog mm. always encouraged. That education sort of thing to do, and um, a little redhead bloke came from Wagga, and he was sort of uh, <laughs> he was he got on a scholarship in '76, and that's where sort of and Turvey sort of got together and become pretty good mates, um, and still still are. It, it wasn't a bad system when you think about it, because George did go on to become a doctor, and you yep. went on to become a teacher, and absolutely, it all worked out pretty well in that sense. Yeah, a lot. Of, I think I think that's one of the main things. You know, I don't know what the blokes that today do. I know they're. The, the commitments are pretty, pretty well taken over most of the day. But I've always been in the opinion that it's sort of, you know, they should be sort of have something mm. 
that when they do finish, that's a, it's a, an easier stepping stone into something that they've been love as much as their their footy, you know. And, I, and teaching was one of those things that I, I had a great passion for. Um, I always thought I was hoping to be a vocation, which you know was never about the money. It was about teaching mm. kids and helping kids learn. But um, I think that really, when the footy finished, I had this you know situation mm. where I went walked straight into something which I really enjoyed to do and. I would hope that a lot of the players of today, you know, they find something through their, through their, you know, their first love, which is to be a professional rugby league player, to actually have something else on the side that's growing, mm. and that when you do finish, it's it's a pretty easy transition into what we would call, probably call real existence. You know, we, <laughs> in those years, yeah, you, yep. you live in this, you live in this environment and this world that uh, it's pretty amazing. And it's a big bridge. There's no doubt about so, that. Now. At that time, um, you, you were a five eight as well as a winger. So, what were you playing in your in your school days, and were you kicking goals then as well? Yeah, I played in the centre and played five eight. Um, you know, probably because the the ball was there, and um, and uh, yeah, I wasn't a big guy, but my defence in those years was I had to sort of tackle a bit and all that sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, it, it's when I when I got here, I, I, I saw an, I saw an opportunity. I suppose there was a, there was a few good halfbacks around the time. Mal Creevy was one of the mm. halfbacks, and um, and I and going into grade, I thought me, I might be a better opportunity in the wing because I had good speed. And right through school, I kicked goals. I always enjoyed kicking goals, and um, and I practiced a lot. So I gathered that um, that was going to be an important thing if I was going to keep going. So yeah, so I went from there. Tell us about your goal kicking because it, it's so different today. Once upon a time, Johnny Gray was the the North Sydney hooker who brought that in what we used to call English style around, yeah, around the, corner, the corner kicking. Yep. Uh, to the, to the league, but everyone else was kicking straight on. Yep. Um, h- how was that? And and tell us how you developed your style, how often you practiced, all those things. Well, it was interesting. You know, I lived at Auburn and, uh, and I used to go down um, just down the road. I can't remember what the field was. Now I was down near Cooks River. I know that. And I had in Bullfrog gave me a couple of balls to sort of take, and and I'd probably practice most afternoons. You know, after teaching at school, I'd go down there if I wasn't training. Because we only trained Tuesday, Thursday, and then uh, Saturday morning, and then normally played on a Sunday, or you know, if we, were, we had a big game, we might have been at the crew ground or whatever it might be, or away. But um, yeah, so I, I'd, I'd go down there, and I, 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 I practiced. I, you know, I enjoyed the idea of, of this, and you know, and it, um, yeah, it went from one side to the other. I didn't sort of go from the sideline much. I just sort of got the angle either side, and kicking and the ball was, you know, one of those things, you know, yeah. I don't know how I did it at the time because I had soft boots. I had soft toe boots. And, um, yeah, it was an interesting sort of concept. I felt that I had a better feel for it, um, kicking that. But, uh, yeah, the old leather balls were interesting. About 40 metres was an absolute limit. Well, they were like bowling balls in the in the wet, weren't well, they? Well, it got wet. <laughs> it's pretty hard kicking yeah. But, you know, just <laughs> probably get it off the ground as much <laughs> as I could at the time, you know. And a lot of the they blokes, soaked up a bit of water. Yeah. A lot of the blacks, a lot of the goal kickers, Mick Cronin and whatever, Graham Moody, you know, they, they sort of had hard toe, I think. But I, I just had a, a real better feel for the soft toe and even the boots were, were good, you know, at the time. So, yeah, so a lot of practice and, yeah, it worked for me over the years. And, and um, I suppose was your focus on a direct approach? Was was it about contact with the ball? What, what were the basics? Because the round-the-corner style is a little bit like um, uh, uh, a soccer kick. Yep. Um, in in the sense of how you make contact with the ball, where it is on the boot, and all those things. Um, even though the balls are very different, obviously, but there are some similarities. What what about front on kicking? Oh, what the are the fir- key elements? Well, yeah, well, I think the first thing was you know obviously the placing the ball because they got twos now. And it's pretty mm. much you got a perfect sort of lie. Did you, you had sand in those days? Didn't you? Just sand yeah. or dirt or whatever it might be. Yeah, uh, was that just to obviously elevate the the ball and to keep it like on an angle that's going to be pretty regulation, not too high, not too low. Um, which will which will sort of shoot the ball to like pretty much looking at the top of a goalpost sort of thing. Um, the steps back, I, I practiced for a couple of years before I came down to about seven or eight steps and there was like a little shuffle sort of thing. And then it, the other thing, the most important thing was obviously my foot, my left foot in the right spot. So mm. the right foot was right in time with each other mm. sort of thing. And obviously, same as anything, like I always sort of remember, I always sort of think it was golf, you know, you sort of just keep your head down and whatever it is and don't lift it and it's pretty much the same as like hitting a golf ball. My memories of you goal kicking are in fact that focus, that head down focusing on the ball. I think it was just from memory 
before your major run in. Uh, to me, that was distinctive. I don't know why, but I suppose everyone sort of did that. But it just seemed to me something I remember about your style because there's a lot of variation in, in side-on styles, particularly with their yeah. movement. Um, and a lot of that's to do with, like a lot of sports, getting a routine in your head so that you're consistent, isn't it? But Absolutely. There wasn't a lot of variation in the front-on kicking in terms of, your, you know, not a lot of hop-stepping and jumping and all no, those no. things. No, I think most of the players, you know, like I know Mick Cronin was I had only a few steps and not, but yeah. – Graham Eady was sort of, and Steve Rogers, they sort of took a few steps. But it's, it's how you feel and whatever. And basically that left foot, getting it bang mm. on with the right foot and follow through, as I said, very much like golf. And then just keep your head down and just hope for the best. And for a lot of the time too, when you hit that ball, a lot of the time it didn't make, the wind didn't make much difference to it. A little bit like golf again, I know, but it's, um, you hit it true, it didn't really move too much. Mm. So um, that was the idea too, to make sure you get a nice clean hit at it and keep for the best. We're going to go through year by year, but I just want to get a broad sense initially of the late 70s or mid to late 70s Bulldogs because there was the grand final in 74, of course. So was there – you came along a little bit after that, but was there a sense that the club was building to that first premiership when you joined? How, how, how did it feel? I, I, I want to go through the coaches in a minute because you came in on the end of the Malcolm Clift era, didn't you? Yep. yep. Um, did you when you first joined the club? Did you get a feeling from '74 that there was that premiership was coming? I don't know. Well, uh, the club itself, you know, we, we were all well aware that it was, you know, 35 to 40 years type thing was in that in that mm. sphere that they hadn't won a comp for that long, and and a very very proud uh, club. And um and I arrived in 1975, and as I said, you know, it's and there was a lot of there was a lot of people there, like in '74 the the year before, there was blokes like Gary Dowling and mm. Donny Mosley and all that. All the used boys were very young at the time and Pete Winchester and Charlo and all those sort of blokes and uh, George. So you, you had – there was this young group of blokes who had, that um, they got to the grand final. And, you know, like if they, a lot of people say you've got to get there, you know, to, to win one or whatever it is. But I think they had a lot of experience about after that day. The East were a good side and they obviously proved it again the following year and they were backed up and won it again in 75. I think the, it certainly was building because there was a, a nucleus of, of good players there. But there were also blokes like Donnie mm. and like um, Gary Dowling that was sort of uh, there and they were goal kickers and there was Phil Young who was also a very good player. You know? mm. And then all of a sudden like in – 75, 76, myself and Steve Mortimer for just two examples, arrive and um, and we start to play a bit of footy. And um, there's connections there and Bullfrog obviously sees this, Shifty sees it. And we become good friends and we're young. We're, and we're, and we're also, there was a build, there was certainly a build up in that era. In that era. And I think Bobby McCarthy and Gary Stevens came over it in, uh, in that sort of period of time before 79. And there was blokes like Billy Noonan and Hargs, mm. Stevie Hargs, Normie Thomas, all those sort of blokes who they moved on to Newtown um, sort of at the back end of 70. So there was there was the opening then for this new brigade of sort of blokes right. with experience to see what they could do. So You played four games uh, as a teenager under Malcolm Clift. What was that like? What was Clift Shifty like as Shifty a Shifty was great. Oh, look, he um, – he, uh, he gave me an opportunity, you know. I I, I got a, I got a, had a few injuries in my early years, you know. I was I was only weighing about seventy kilo or something or other, and um, yeah, I probably just was a bit small, and um, but I probably showed enough in my speed and kicking whatever to you know say that oh, you've got to give this kid a chance, whatever, and maybe get bigger and, and improve and all that. So I had a few things in there, but Shifty was certainly and the club um, was very supportive of. Of me, particularly in '77, I when I did my knee and early in the piece, and um, uh, that was that was very nerve shattering, like for me. And you know, my mother and father tell you that I was an absolute mm. pony ass. You know, <laughs> you know, this is it. I can't play anymore. No, no. So they pulled the cartilage out as they did in those years, and <laughs> and then you'll be right. So then I came back um, in '77 after about eight or nine weeks, and they put me straight in first grade and went all right. And then, but then. I went, the AMCO Cup was up in Queensland for the first time, you know, so I thought I can't yeah. miss this trip away. So up, I go there, play there, went all right, and then played again on the next Sunday. So I played three games in seven days and my knee just blew up. So uh. I was out again for about another five weeks because it was just, it was stupid for me really. But, um, 
yeah, but, I, but the opportunities were there, it was starting to happen for me and I just had to sort of get a bit bigger, so put a bit of weight. And so paint a, paint a picture if you like. You mentioned earlier you're training twice a week. Um, a lot of us who played park footy or any sport at that amateur level, um, the weekend warriors, um, we can identify with that. But Absolutely. it's amazing playing at that level. And um, uh, e- even even from my memory, uh, which goes a long way back too, um, I, I I actually had the impression that there was there was more done than that. But of course, full time employees. Absolutely. And and what? How much extra work did you do by yourself, Steve? Well, I as mean, I said, you know, the goal kicking, I, I I did that, and in the off season was just runs and everything. I, mm. I was a naturally a, a pretty fit sort of person, uh, but I did I ran a lot, you know, distance runs in the off season, all that sort of stuff, and. And I did uh, when Dave Irvine came to the club uh, as the sprint coach, and and Dave Cooper, more uh, Irvine, I, he sort of taught me a little bit more about me running, and um, and yeah, when I got to when I got to the, the, here, I, I felt like I was in the top two or three blokes as far as speed was concerned, even in my early years of seventy six, seventy seven, uh, and I think Dave Irvine only really helped me there, and that was and Shifty as well, so they sent me out the back of where it was, Parramatta somewhere or other, and I used to train. Dave Elvo used to take me on these 300, 400 metre run-throughs, you know, to build up stamina but also get a, my style right and everything else. So I, though him, Dave Cooper and Dave Irvine, I, I credit them with a lot of the stuff, how I actually developed as a, as a footballer mm. physically and didn't sort of lose any goal-kicking style or whatever it might be and, and just to maintain a position in the side. So, uh, yeah, it was like a learning curve. It was like but, – but there was this group of blokes from about 77, 78 that went – I think, you know, Gus sort of talks about it a bit in the moment here mm. that, you know, you're trying to sort of get together a group of blokes that are actually sort of, you know, come together mm. – and know each other's game, and then all of a sudden bounce off each other. Then you know, you know, a little bit, obviously, like Penrith in a sense. Mm. But um, yeah, I think it really does make a difference when you sort of put them all together. Ted Glossop comes in as coach. What yep. was that like? Oh, Ted was totally different. Shifty, Shifty was, a bit of, you know, a bit of a cowboy and everything. But he was, he was a good coach. He was a good technical coach. Um, uh, Ted was more, you know, like the old school teacher. You know, so I, I was going to ask you that. I had a bit of <laughs> school <laughs> teachers are. are uh, are a different kind of coach, aren't they? Yeah, I, I, yeah well, I had a bit of in all sports. Yeah. yeah, with him. Yeah, so he um, he, more of a gentle sort of sort of guy. Um, he 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 made sense everything he sort of did, but he actually sort of the the players at the time under Ted. You know, I think we sort of came together as such a good group mm. um, that we sort of we go out in the field and, and it's sort of in particularly in, in the late seventies nine sort of season, we really sort of thought. We had half a chance all the time winning, all right. the time. didn't matter. And I think that's where the entertainer sort of tag came into it. It was more 78, 79. And, you know, the emergence of Turvey and whatever. And, and But also the Mortimers, the Mortimer brothers. And then you had all these really experienced guys like Apes and the Hughes boys and mm. George and – so, given given all that, how technical was Ted? How technical did he need to be? Because coaching obviously is highly dependent on what type of player you've got in your roster. So, given all that you've just said, um, where was Ted's strength in terms of contributing to that talent and how it was used? I think he was more of a people's guy. He's mm. probably more along the line of uh, maybe Bennett. You know, right. Um, I think he sort of he gave you the encouragement. Okay, you're in the side, you've been picked, but this is the sort of thing you got to. This is what your contribution mm. has got to be, you know. And so, and I was, and it was very clear to me what my contribution needed to be, you know. Um, it was basically do my best in defence, you know. If I had Chris Mortimer next to me, I didn't have to worry about that. So, but um, but to score tries, you know, obviously when I'm given a free run, I've I've got to get there and obviously kick goals. So. I, I was very aware of exactly what I had to do and as as I think all the other players too, I think Ted was probably good at that, you know. That's how it was with me. Um, like Steve Mortimer, I know, like him and Gary Hughes were very, very different in the way that they went about the game but both were very significant because of the types of things happened. How know? were they different, Gary and Steve? Well, Toby was more of instinctive, obviously. Um, you know, at any time... 
in the 80 minutes, the ball could come to me in in five seconds. In in different ways, I presume. In different ways. Yeah. You know, um, Gary was more the the, the 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 settling influence of the of the team, and um, and he'd settle the team down a bit, and, and just just a really good connection in the chain. Mm. But we had we had forwards that were like backs, and mm. they were quick, and so we we all of a sudden we developed this style of play. And I, I remember a lot of the time on a Thursday, we like Tuesday, we'd be fitness and all that. We train with all the rest of the club, which is always a good thing too. By the way, that was a really good idea. So the whole club mm. train with the first grade, or even if you got dropped to second grade, everyone's sort of there. But then on a Thursday, we'd have ball work, and then Saturday morning have a bit of ball work. But on Thursday, sometimes we'd always, well, most of the time, the squad would go out. There's probably about fourteen of us, whatever it was. We'd go out on Belmore Oval and always forwards versus backs. Played touch footy. Anyway, there'd be a lot of times on a Thursday, well, yeah. he, we'd be going for about 40 minutes, you know, and <laughs> yeah. Ted would be standing on the sideline because he's watching this stuff go on because we all, we always sort of, you know, we got very competitive and mm. we got, you had heaps and, you know, folks here and you had all those blokes who were like, like backs, Mark mm. Hughes, you know. Very mobile, all yeah. Very mobile sort of guys, you know. They thought they could sort of run quick or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, it was – but it was very, very, you know, competitive. Mm. Anyway, so that was – that used to be a lot of fun. And I think – but Ted would then go, okay, let's get back on the training field. And then we'd sort of run and do a few plays, whatever it might be. But then he'd say, right, it uh, uh, was always four up and four back or six up and six back or two up and two back, no drop ball. Mm. And that that little moment – I'd never forget that because, you know, blokes would be diving for the ball to make sure there wasn't, you know, they because going to get out of there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, that's it for training and whatever. But uh, he had these these little quirky things that, that was very teacher-orientated, I suppose, which I sort of really sort of got. Mm. I didn't – I wasn't – I started teaching in 79, but I, I sort of got the idea. He had a bit of method behind mm-hmm. that, but he was oh, – I would say more of a people's guy, but, yeah, he did – obviously did the job. Steve Gearan is unleashed this week, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. Let's talk about 1977 before we get on to the really exciting good years because you had a lot of injuries that year. How tough was that? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Uh, you know, you, you get injuries um, and you, you, you work your way to – that's your dream. And, um, you know, I was watching me mate, Derby, sort of um, go from, you know, just in 76, We, as I said, we sort of met up, we become good mates and I'm watching him sort of do his thing and all that sort of stuff. And then, um, and but I, then I sort of thought to myself, well, I got to, you know, I've just got to just try and um, do something about it. And so the body was sort of part of the reasons so I put on a massive, like three or four kilos at the time. I had mm. that period of time. I, I think I only weighed about 75, 76 in 80 anyway. But I, but I, I was, I certainly was quicker. And my, I think my goal kicking was just consistently improving because of the practice. So, um, yeah, 77 was tough, but uh, yeah, it's, it's what you had to do. Well, you, you came back in 78. Um, the club finished fifth, equal on 28 points with Parramatta. That's significant because uh, they won the minor preliminary semi final 22 15, and that knocked the Bulldogs out of the competition. But this is where you really started to get up ahead of steam. Tim Pickup played. Um, Steve was 22 at that time. Um, a, a quick word before we talk about uh, Turvey, but um, what was it like playing with Tim Pickup, one of the greats for Canterbury? <laughs> We don't um, we don't often hear that much about him. Oh, grub! <laughs> God bless him. Uh, yeah, he he was he was a, a wonderful mentor for um, for young players at the, mm. at the club, and Bullfrog knew that. And um, I, I spent a number, of, particularly on trips away with um, with Grub, and uh, he was just he's just a quirky character with obviously a history. And um, and he he was very good at um, knowing when you you know if you've had a good game or you, or you can do better in, in some of your stuff. He gave great advice in a really positive way. At Grub, um, yeah, he he was part of that you know that whole thing resurgence to to get to what everyone wants to do is to win a comp. Mm. He was pretty you know him and and then when Bobby McCarthy came over and Stevens, what what they all did, they gave us this experience about you know, what it's like and what you've got to do. And, and you, you don't have to do too much in these big games. you just got to do what you got to do, you know. Mm. And um, Grubb was very much along that. He was, and he was very supportive of me over the time playing. So, And, and of, of course, Turvey also a half. And, and how was he sort of starting to emerge in that period? Was 
See, today we talk about intuitive players like that and how they're quite yeah. often shackled by structure and the coach is kind of fixated on how they want to get the team around the field. Uh, in those days, what was it like, Steve? I mean, uh, Turvey had this incredible – and it wouldn't always come off, but um, how much, how much you know, leeway did he get and how did you sort of realise that it was better off just letting him do his thing? I don't know. Um, yeah, you know, I think I, with Red, I, I think he, with the team itself, it was it's pretty hard to explain because, you know, he basically whatever he thought he should do, he didn't really. He wasn't asking any questions. He just thought <laughs> he this, just did this, it. This is where this is where we we're going, you know. <laughs> and I don't care what the rest of you be. You're just gonna have to follow me because. <laughs> Anything could happen here. Could, <laughs> he'd call some play and then all of a sudden do a chip over the top. When, yeah. Where'd that come from? <laughs> well, that's instinctive football, mm. you know, and that's what they that's what they call these days eyes up footy, you know, yeah. which is, you know, we played that all the time. But um, there, there, there would have been many of the tries that over the years um, that I scored that were pretty much only 20 metres out from our own line. I love the entertainers and pick me in 79, mm. 80, like because we – they. They were scored from a long way out sometimes, um, but a lot of it was ignited a bit by him. And not to say that Gary wasn't involved in this too. Like he, mm. he obviously when when Turvey's sort of doing his impromptu things all the time, he's he's that steady influence still all the time, you know. And um, but all but uh, all of us then sort of if something was on was on, you know. So we and we sort of we knew what to do, and yeah, I'll are they, you know. Well, the, crowds, I mean. the, one of the things um, people identify with those years is, of course, the turvy chip kick, uh, but also, um, as you said, tries within your own 20. There were a lot of tries scored, not only from your own half of the field, but the number of passes, the, 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 the continuity uh, of passing in those days was, was quite extraordinary. I know defensive structures now are, are, pretty, uh, are pretty restrictive in a lot of ways, even though they have a 10-metre rule, but... In those days, it must have been really interesting being on the end of all that because I remember the ball going across the field and back on some of the tries we scored. Sometimes we didn't necessarily score but managed to get the ball back and forth across the field, which you very rarely see these days. Yeah, oh, look, Apes and, I, Apes and I had a picnic pretty much over those years. <laughs> you know, the ball was going everywhere, yeah. you know. It was unbelievable. So you sort of uh, – you just had to be ready for all that. And then you had a bloke like Stan Cutler who was a great player. Mm. Uh, GB obviously came in when Stan was hurt and all that sort of stuff, but he was a really good player, injecting himself so well. And then the Mortimers, obviously, and, you know, GB and, you know, I, I think uh, how it all developed too, it just wasn't the back still. Obviously, the, the black like all of a sudden who came into the link would be Mark Hughes all of a sudden, then you'd mm. Graham Hughes and Steve Folks and like and all these blokes play. Yeah. Play with the ball and, uh, yeah, so... Apes and I were very fortunate to be on the end of a lot of it. It was great. Yeah, the ball didn't die with the back rowers, did it? Um, when when they got involved, which which Robber, you know. like well, Robber. Yeah, there's another there's another guy, you know, like him and Johnny Cavney, like, and then you had blokes that would been there in the past. But these blokes were when I mentioned all these people, they're all these guys now, like mid twenties. Mm. Then they're not really older guys for the game. They're um, mid twenties, and we're all sort of early twenties. Um. I think that was the secret too. They're all young men. 1979, you broke George Tailforth's club point scoring record with 204. Uh, the team finished fifth again. Uh, amazing run to the grand final though this time and I remember it vividly. Uh, West, Cronulla, Parramatta. Back in those days you didn't have streaming services where you could watch every game. <laughs> but um, we saw it on – I watched it on the ABC back then in the country um, and uh, it was just breathtaking. Tell us – um, top five, of course, so it's a little bit different, the format to, to what it is today. But um, I don't know, what was it like being part of that run to the grand final? Um, St George was such a hot favourite that year. I'll get to that actual game in a minute. But just yeah. the, the incredibly entertaining football that you lot played in that time in finals, um, how did that feel? Yeah, it was pretty amazing because we were all having a beer on the last comp because uh, someone had to beat someone. Mm. For us to run fifth, and, and it, that's right, yeah. So we're all sort of, you know, having a drink. You know, it's there's no chance <laughs> this it could work. Be. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. You know, so we're all on the on the, uh, on the piss, so to speak. And um, all of a sudden, it, it happens. Well, all of a sudden, everyone's you know like 
phone call there going, I don't know where all you are, where it is. But uh, you got a game next yeah, week. You got a game next week. <laughs> so that, so that, that's, that's so that, that's a good start to us already. You know, so then we got there on Tuesday. We just couldn't believe we we're in there. You know, like so anyway. But it was the beginning of, um, and because we're now on the on the big stage at the cricket ground, and um, and we had a great affiliation with that over these next couple of years. We love playing out. And apart from Belmore, that was the that was the field, you know, and um, so that was really exciting. And obviously, the emergence of Turvey was at his top. You know, he just he, he was just doing all sorts of stuff. But it, but it wasn't just him. It was just that the, how we were playing the game was just this, you know, razzle dazzle stuff that was really working for us. And we thought we were got one game, we'll play one game at a time, we'll just do our thing. And so, consequently, it's sort of that was the emergence of this this sort of type of game that we're playing. And, um, yeah, and we, we get to the uh, final, we got taught a bit of a lesson. So. Well, what happened in that first half in the grand final? Just they were just a bit too good on the day. You know, they, they got all their forwards and they rolled through us and uh, it was a bit hard in there. Right? And we're all sort of, you know, you've, you've got your wide-eyed, you know, and, um, yeah, it was just one of those things before we knew it, it's 17-0, you know, and mm. uh, run it off and... Sort of felt to ourselves, oh, and you know, obviously we're all pretty embarrassed in the at halftime in the sheds about what was going on, and um, and that was, and I think, but that was the secret. I think everyone in the team wasn't when there was no one ever pointing fingers at anyone. Mm. It was the whole team like, what are we doing? You know, Wh- where's that form? The last three games gone, and how are we going to do something? And uh, yeah, we nearly get, we nearly did it, except well, for the goal kicker. Well, what? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the very second funny, half. Very funny story. Yeah, Heather, Heather, me- Heather Glossop, who was very blunt, um, lovely lady. Ted's uh, wife. Ted's wife. Yeah. Um, her, her comment to me um, on grand final night, up, at, up there, we were pretty shattered about the name and all that sort of stuff. She said, you know, Baba, can I talk to you for a moment? I said, yeah. She said, if you were to kick those two goals, <laughs> it'd be, it would have been a draw. <laughs> and we would have been in the extra time. I hope you realise that. Thanks, Heather. <laughs> You did score that. a try, though. Scored a try, yeah. And, the, and the, I only missed it too. They were all from the sideline. But, you know, on my expectations in those years, you know, I, I should get most of them. And, uh, yeah, a bit disappointed. But, you know, it's just one of those things, you know. Now, I'm going to take a stab here and, and say that Bubba came from your youthful looks. Or is there something else behind that? Yeah, um, well, well uh, there was four Steves in the under-23s. <laughs> And my and obviously I've when I got there I looked about twelve. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that was pretty. Yeah, so not that's a bad thing, but yeah. So that thus Bubba. Yeah. So um and it just and it just stuck. So you know like even to this day you know Morton was just calling me Bubs. You know I had, I just sat same as anything Turby and Louis and whatever. So yeah. It, 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 and it stuck. And it's now we but, know we, but no one else calls me that. It's funny. Well, Turvey comes from Turvey Park yeah. uh, in Wagga. Uh, that's that's famous. Mm. Louie, where did that come from? Oh, we've got to be careful I, with nicknames because sometimes they have origins that are a bit. <laughs> oh, he reckons. He reckons. Louis the Lip. And that's I, Chris I, Mortimer, I, by the yeah, way. Sorry. Yeah, Chris Mortimer. Um, Louis the Lip. Oh, I can imagine him. I can imagine him <laughs> like in his early days. He'd be <laughs> lipping everyone. But he'd, back, he'd be one of those blacks who could back it up. So yeah, yeah. He was. Uh, he was the outstanding, outstanding player. Both of them. Both the all the board of us. That, that's another thing that has been brought up because we talk about the versatility and mobility of the forwards, but also the defence of the back line. Of Chris and and then, of course, Andrew Farrah went on to become very famous for their very authoritative defence in the centres. And, and uh, that was a big part of our game, which has been referred to a lot. But that's something that um, the entertainers probably – it wasn't like you conceded a lot of points, is it? It wasn't like you had a score fest where you just wanted to, you know, win 34-30. It wasn't like that. There was still good defence there. A little bit. I oh, look, you know, if, yeah, it was probably more on the idea we'd rather have the ball yeah. than be tackling, <laughs> particularly me. But, uh, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I think the defence in there was, was still very sound mm. in, in a lot of ways, but... In that in that grand final, St George, they had a big pack of forwards, and they just rolled down the middle. And um, mm. well, that and, was a very good side, obviously. Yeah, I mean, no, good side, St George. Yeah. Good sides win grand finals. Uh, that, that goes without saying. But then yeah. we have referred to 
the 74 Roosters team and then you move on to some of the teams that beat us in grand finals in the 90s, for example, like the uh, the Raiders and the Broncos. That if you look at those particular teams in the con- in historical context, oh, we, we, we knew they seven. were good at the time, but if you look back, oh. they're even better yeah. uh, when you look at the representative players that they featured at that time. But now after 79, what, what was the thought then? How, how was Ted Glossop's perspective after you'd lost that grand final going into 1980? What was the view then? Well, we had a great trip away, <laughs> so that was good. That's always good. Where'd That's you go? Uh, I think we were over the States. We, oh, yeah. we normally went over the States. That so was Bullfrog's um, usual. Yeah, always thing, over yeah. to um, the, the, um, where, the east coast of uh, California and all there, and uh, we might have Los Angeles or San Francisco, all that sort of stuff, LA, mm. um, and then about 10 days in Hawaii on the way home. Um, wonderful trips, you know, great trip. Everyone wanted to get on that, but he had to play a number of games to sort of get on there. Right. Was that common in those days for, for uh, all the I think, clubs? I, I, think he, I, think, I think he probably pretty much started all that too, right. by the way. Yeah, 1977, I don't know whether I played enough games, but all of a sudden I was on the squad to get there. and that was. <laughs> but I think he was sending me more than anything to just grow up a bit, you know, right. and, amongst all the older guys. And, uh, and the, that influence overseas was um, – Unbelievable for me to grow up, you know. Really? You learn, oh, well, just the blokes mi- mixing with older guys and all yeah. that sort of stuff and um, just just learning and maturing, I think. And uh, I found the trips away were a wonderful sort of thing for all of us, really. And you got closer to certain people too. You know, you mm. had that time then to spend time with them socially and all that and, um, you know, carry on a bit. Did but it I'm ever sure. backfire? Did you ever sort of have disagreements, any falling out or anything like that? No, I can't remember mm. really anything, you know. And and in those years, that's where Turvey and I we were roommates, pretty much all the, all those uh, trips away, and we got to know each other really well. And then obviously Louis and come along, and he was sort of part of the group when he got there in '79. But you know, there was there was uh, there was an older group of pl- older group of players like the Hughes boys and mm. George and all that sort of stuff. And then there was a the younger group. So you know, when you're away, you sort of mix it up and all that. But it was just hanging out. I think that really helped too. What influence did George have back in those days? Of course, an iconic captain for not only the Bulldogs but Australia, but he was the doctor. He was Dr George Paponis and everyone in the game, whether you're a Dogs fan or not, actually looked up to George Paponis. So did he have that effect on the team? Very calm, um, George. Um, he, uh, he he was one of those blokes that actually he, he, he just took charge of whatever, was, whatever had to be done, a decision that had to be made. Mm. Uh, not that there was too many of those sort of things. He would only be asking me, but he would he would look at it himself and said, "You're right with this, aren't you?" I said, "Whatever to kick a goal because in those years was the penalties, you know." Yeah, yeah. You know, we, you took penalty kicks a lot in those days, and so that could make a difference if I kept knocking them over. And um, so he'd say, "You know, you're right." Particularly, it was a little bit further out than forty meters. It's about me distance at the time. And, um, and he'd say, you know, what he's like. But it was just his calming influence about decision-making on there. And like, and he'd, and he'd come out of dummy half himself and he'd do his best out of all that sort of stuff. He, he played his role, did that well. And uh, But also he was just a nice enough bloke, George, mm. you know. And, you know, so he was just a, a, a really good cog in what was sort of developing into this really good team. So 1980, how did that season unfold? You were the leading scorer in the – competition, not just the Bulldogs in those days. So that was 220 points. Um, the club finished equal on points with the Roosters, but second on the ladder. Um, how how was your state of mind compared to 79? We were very calm. You know, I, I, I think the experience of the year before um, would have been absolutely stupid if we didn't sort of realise what you had to do, you know. Mm. And I think um, Bullfrog changed a few things on grand final day. We sort of – we didn't go – our, find our own way out there. We sort of went on lim, in a limousine and just a, another pair. It was four people in a car with their girlfriends or wives or whatever. And um, So prior to that, um, just to yeah. get it in perspective, prior to that, teams go to a grand final, would, would you just go on your own? Yeah, I think Well, in, in 79 we did. You mm. know, it was just uh, off you go. So you've, No bus or anything like no, that. Or, no. yeah. So... Yeah, it I think was different out, back in the old oh, days. Oh, it'll right? be different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, and I think well, there might have been some teams that went sort of together, some yeah. people went together and all that sort of stuff. But, yes, a lot of blokes like to get there really early and others like to get there not pretty much on time, just mm-hmm. sort of you only got, you know, at half time of the – even like even in a normal game at Belmore, you know, you sort of um, 
it's a lot of blokes just want to get in there, at, you know, at half time of the reserve grade and, yeah. and get ready, and others would like to get in there earlier. So, yeah, a lot of blokes' prep, preparation were a bit different, but um, yeah, we so we we went in there together, and then and I think it was just the team itself. We'd we'd played. Uh, we're playing the Roosters in the major semi, I think, mm. and we actually we won pretty well there, and and not comfortably, but in our own heads. I I just know myself. I felt really comfortable on that day. Kicked a few goals and scored a try. Whatever whatever happened on the day, and that put us straight into the GF. So then the, ne- the next big thing was really to what do you do in the next two weeks? Well, in those days there was a lot of conjecture about that, wasn't there? These days I think it's pretty much universal that coaches and players like the extra week. But back then it was a massive debate every year in a, in, in a grand final year. Oh, I don't know if we want this week off, you know, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Because Sorry. obviously the training load yep. uh, wasn't like it is and certainly probably it's fair to say the media attention is a little different these days than it was back then. There wasn't as much media no. um, and it was probably managed very differently. So h- how was it for you with the week off? Well, I, I went to school. I, went, I taught in that week um, before the last week, GF. Um, and the school gave me the week off um, in preparation. Mm. Uh, what was the atmosphere like at school? I suppose pretty, the kids were all oh, <laughs> driving was, you was, mad. It was pretty crazy. <laughs> I often sort of say that, you know, like I don't know what the blokes are today, obviously whatever they do, but I'd, um, I'd often um, – 79 I started teaching and then 1980 and at Dulles Ashfield. And uh, anyway, I had, and I, was in a, I had a class of about 40-odd kids, year fives, you know, and that was the norm sort of thing. And we were next door to Bethlehem Girls College, so right. I sort of and that, there, it was pretty a pretty solid Canterbury sort of group of supporters, even though it was sort of more West sort of thing right. there. And uh, yeah, so like I, I'd go I'd go to school and uh, and teach and and do me thing, and then um, and then on that last week, nothing. So, but it was interesting times. Yeah, yeah I, you know, how was training different, if at all? Um, I don't think we did too much different, actually. Mm. You know, I think I think that was the secret to it too. You know, mm. you, you, as I said in that last week, I probably just did a bit more goal kicking practice. Um, and but apart from that, we played on the Saturday, so I'm, I'm thinking that we trained on the Tuesday and the Thursday, and mm. we might have sort of met maybe on the Friday, but I don't think so. But it was a Saturday, so and we just met at the club, and uh, we, we we I was I travelled out there with Peter Mortimer and. His wife Julie and, and Kerry and I were. I'd met Kerry the year before, and um, yeah, so we travelled out in the car, and I, th- I think we we're all. I was very calm. It was a very different situation, you know, to the year yeah. before. Did so. Ted Glossop have any? What, what did he say? I, th- I think. Game? I think. Well, it's more more than just keeping it calm and keeping it. But mm. then you, you all got to know what you got to do when you get out there this time, you know. And but we had a different team. There was a we had a more experienced team. And um, a couple other blokes. I think uh, I think Greg Cook uh, was one of the front rowers, and maybe someone else. I can't think. But in you know, on the grand final day, I think it was Robbo and um, Johnny Caveney. Mm. So and all, everyone was fit. There mm. were, except for Stan, unfortunately, and GB. Obviously, then came into the pretty handy replacement. Pretty Greg Brandall. Yeah, unbelievable. Um, Great player. I yeah, mean, right. Stan Cutler, an absolute legend of the mm, club, and absolutely. we will be hoping to get him on this show very soon, actually, before the year's out, but yeah, or the place, season's yeah. out. Um, and but but having Greg Brentnell come in for Stan at that time, I mean, that's just yeah, no, that's not bad. Ma- well, it was pretty amazing. Jimmy, was, you know, he, and he had an unbelievable year that year. It's pretty amazing. You know, I think he went from like he, he was playing, and then I think he went from the city team and or the city team, and then he. Someone got hurt, and then he went to the state team, and then I think Steve Rogers or someone got hurt, and then he went play for Australia, mm-hmm. all in the one year, <laughs> and then got to the grand final and put up a little kick for me. Uh, I remember watching the game. I was at university uh, at that time myself, and um, uh, I don't know. It, it was one of those games where you, as a fan, you felt like we had it. From almost the early exchanges, uh, there was never that fear. Or oh, uh, the Roosters looking particularly good today. Not that they weren't good. Uh, it's just that how was it as a player out there, mate? How did you feel uh, in the early? Because the early exchanges of a grand final, particularly back in the early, the, what do they call it, the softening up softening period. Up period, yeah. Uh, that you, you never quite know which ways the game's going to go until after that period, do you? How did it feel for you? Yeah, well, it's like the first half sort of went. You know, uh, Ope scored. Well, I had a kick early, and in front which is always great, 
Mm. Um, and then um, I hit it, even though it was pretty much in front, I hit it really good and I thought, oh, yeah, well, like, I just remember what, what you're doing. And then I scored pretty much near the post and so, and then I think, uh, I think it was Kevin Wright, he, um, he, had, he was the goal kicker for East. And it was, so it was seven four at half time, and mm. it was like a pretty regulation game. Like it was back and forward, back and forward, and you know everyone was probably doing their job, and apart from you know up scoring, you know it was a pretty tight match. And and right, he was always a pretty good goal kicker too, you know. So it's sort of um, it was just one of those things. So at half time, was still probably anyone's game. And then tell us about the 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 second half and when I mean I suppose when you scored the iconic try that was almost the icing on the cake because it you, you must have felt like you had it even before that try didn't you? Oh, the forwards were playing so our forwards were playing well and you got to remember like, we, I had three penalty kicks in the second half mm. I hit every one of them and I just and it was just one of those days and uh, so I we were sort of it was only six or so minutes to go and we're all you know we're not looking at the, the clock but you're sort of like uh, this. You know, well, we've nearly got this thing. You know, <laughs> it was quite funny because it's yeah. what was the thirteen four or whatever the score was at that point, and um, so I was probably more. I, I, even to this day, I was I was more happy with myself and the fact that getting six out of six on the day was was my job, and uh, I just thought, oh yeah, that was probably the greatest moment. And but you know, it's pretty hard to miss the next thing. We, we talked on the previous show about your life after the try and how that particular try changed it. Let's now talk about the moments up to that try. Give us a, give us a sense of where you were, what it was like before Greg put up that kick. Yeah. Uh, it, it was only about six or seven minutes ago or whatever. And it's and at, at training, not that you, not you practice it, but a lot of the time GB would put up kicks at training and whatever and you'd sort of catch it and whatever you did, you know. Uh, in this instance, you know, he just came into the line. I think it came off heaps and um, he all of a sudden got in there and then just launched this ball, you know. <laughs> Do you ever explain why? <laughs> I saw him last year. No, I don't, we don't, it's, it's quite funny. We sort of, sort of you know, you know, how you go with you know, the stuff we're just talking. He goes, oh, mate, I'm just the bloke that kicked the ball. So and <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm the bloke that caught it. So how good is that? So that's our, that's our standard joke. I'm the bloke that kicked the ball. He said, mate, I... Play for Australia. I did this, did that, and all I'm remembered for is I kicked the ball so you could catch it. <laughs> but I said I was about to caught it. So yeah, but I, it was one of those things. And I, I saw it. I saw it very late. Um, I just ran and then just stuck my hands out pretty much, and I, got, I could. And all of a sudden, it's a bit like that because it's sort of coming over my shoulder. You had a bit of pressure on you defensively. Yeah, well, there was blacks. I wasn't I wasn't thinking about who was there or whatever. Mm. I was just wondering about all of a sudden I could just see this thing coming at me, like just over my shoulder, and all stuck my hands out and. I sort of always say, you know, I caught a ball, you know, and uh, and just was one or two steps and all of a sudden I'm over the line. I couldn't believe what was going on. <laughs> ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And what was the feeling like after you grounded the ball? Because that was it, absolutely. Uh, Ted Glossop, I, I'll never forget that shot because they didn't have a lot of cameras compared to today in the TV coverage. So there are, there are sort of iconic shots that you see because um, that's all you had access to. I, I remember Teddy getting up off the bench and – Starting that triumphant run oh, towards run the sideline, and I think he went like that with his hands, and and uh, the, very I've, excited. Yeah, I don't know how many times I've seen that shot, but um, as well as the try. But it, what was that like at that moment? What was said? Can you remember pretty, anything? Oh, pretty amazing. Um, yeah, ball got down and whatever, and there was you know a lot of hugging and all that sort of stuff. And um, and be honest with you, I, I, I sort of got the ball. I thought, now I've got it. I've got one more thing to do. Yeah, know? that's right. You got to convert. I just got to knock this, knock this save. This will be so good. <laughs> this happens. Well, what, you tell so, us about that because that's a total refocus. Uh, yeah. the, you know, you've won the grand final yeah, by that it's all time. Over. It, yeah. yeah. What What's going on? Oh well, I, I just thought you know, like you know, and I look, I looked up in the lady stand. Mum and dad were there, and I sort of sort of waved to them. I think at one point, or just pointed or whatever, <laughs> and then then got back to what I had to do and just kick the goal over. But oh, I just I was just. And when the whole, I know the whole game, it actually left me the whole situation and the reality of it all, you don't sort of know until after the game and then and mm. also the reality hits you. But I just had to go back and go, it's not getting this thing over. I just got to make, I don't want to miss one, you know. So it was good. Well, know? that's what I was going to say because you've got that funny situation where you don't even need to kick it. But at the same time, you, you want to keep that Absolutely. clean record in the grand final and no you're in the moment and the whole world's watching. Absolutely. 
So um, that, that was my job, you know, and all of a sudden, and then when I'm running back, I'm going to myself, what the hell has happened here? You know, <laughs> this is ridiculous. So, so how do you feel they kick off uh, and there's only a matter of minutes left in the grand final? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it must have been, well, I suppose you just go through the set, don't you? And it's, it's one of those strange things, but everyone must have felt a bit really weird yeah. at that time. I don't, you know, the, the, like any game, you sort of, you know, you're, you're waiting for the thing to go and when you've sort of, you know, you obviously sealed the game, there's no drama. But, you know, the, the actual actually feeling was or would have been for everyone, I suppose. They hadn't won a confidently 40 years, mm. the dogs. And all of a sudden, this when the hooter goes, it's going to be it, you know. And it was just it was mayhem. There was just people ran on. There was people running. I don't think like, – you couldn't see a piece of grass, I think. Well, again, it was very different in those days. Everyone just, just ran. Just yeah. jumped the fences and it was just <laughs> bizarre. Well, well, that, that's a lot of that stuff we don't see on camera, obviously. Uh, again, for the reasons I explained, the coverage is, is much more restricted than it is now. Yeah. They've got cameras everywhere. So give us an idea. Where, where were you? What happened? Where did you go <laughs> well, in the I, middle know, of all I, that mayhem? I think we sort of ran over to uh, – there's, there's a number of pictures that sort of run over to sort of Ted, you know. He was sort of you know, there and, and yep. someone lifted George up or whatever and then, and then you know. Ted got whatever. chaired off too, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, uh, somewhere. Well, I sort of we, – we sort yeah. of lost, lost – I, I got lost <laughs> – in the whole thing, you know, there was just all these people that were just and running around everywhere. Could you remember people saying anything to you, uh, fans or anyone, uh, or I, was it all just a noise? It, just, it was just mayhem. <laughs> I think that's the best because it was just people everywhere and then yeah. uh, and I think they sort of herded them all off to whatever and then all of a sudden <laughs> the reality sort of kicks in and then, uh, yeah, it was just one of those things. But, but I think for the Canterbury fans it was um, just this wonderful moment for them, you know, mm. and, they're, and they're very loyal people. Over here, you know, I, I was very lucky to spend time here. and uh, But at that time, it was just, I was just happened to be one in the middle of it all that um, hadn't done anything for 40 odd years. Rewind one year to 79. Same thing. But of course, it's the Dragons who are celebrating and the Dragons players who are celebrating. Yeah. What was it like losing that grand final? Where were you on the field then? And what did you do? Did you do the usual. You know, slump to the ground and think back where it all went no, wrong. No, I think we what? sort of walked to towards the where we ran out. Yep. And I think I think George, I think um, Ted and that made us sort of watch him do the lap of honour. Yeah. So. What was, know, and, and what was the thinking was behind harsh. that? I think that was, I can guess, but that was pretty hard. Did that um, give you a bit of hunger, or oh, what? Was that the abs- motive? Oh, absolutely. I think you know you like in, like as a schoolboy, as a, mm. as a kid. And rugby league was so big in those years, you know. Uh, it was just it was the game, yeah. and um, you know we got we're here. We could have done it so much better than this, you know. Like, and we proved it in the second half. We we can play football, mm. but we just got blown apart in the first forty minutes. And um, so, yeah, I think all that was helped for the next year. I wonder how how many times did that moment, or was that moment recalled in the build up to the win in eighty? Not really. No, I think it was ever so you, mentioned. you just put that aside. Every, but, but I it think was, everyone knew. Yeah, everyone knew. Yeah, right. Like, you know, you, and that's where they always get with that. You know, if you play one, you can you normally can, and you're definitely more prepared mm. as a as an individual, I think, to play a grand final. But it, but it, in saying that, you've you've got to, it's a game of patience. I, I don't think it's a real game of passion. It's a game of patience. It's a grand final. You still got to have things go your way. I Absolutely. mean, talk, tell the Tigers in in eighty eight and eighty nine. Yeah, look, um, at, and look other some, teams. Of, some of the grand finals mm. that you know, like you, you can't stop. You know, you know, some games are pretty well done with about ten minutes to go. But uh, yeah. So the eighty lap of honour. How was that? Well, as I said, there was. Did, there was more people on the field than in the grandstands. It would have been a slow one. It was very slow. We had the we had the thing. We're just sort of trying to not run into people, and then we had the, the shield. And the thing with Canterbury in those days too, that particular lap of honour, as opposed to all the other laps of honour in all the history of the grand finals, is the brotherhood there. Absolutely. You know, you had the Mortimers and the Hughes, which was significant. You had the family there, but also, as you said, you and the other players were kind of part of the family too. Absolutely. I was. You know, the Mortimers were, were great friends, and I was. You know the that group of boys, you know, basically, you know, like brothers to me, you know, and uh, and GB was just this this guy who was obviously great mates with Red, you know, uh, they'd come from Wagga, and then you had Apes and folks who eventually married Bullfrog's daughters, mm. and um, he got that, and then obviously, you know, the Hughes boys and 
George and you know, there was a, there was like and, and then they had you know the rogue there Robbo you know and uh, who was very influential in, in well, what we did. Yeah, be careful because he's coming on in a couple of weeks. So. Yeah. He's got a last word. He reckon, he, I reckon he'll tell you I got lucky. But anyway, <laughs> That'll be fun. Probably right too. What, what kind of influence was Robbo? We loved oh, him as a player. Uh, I unbelievable. Mean, uh, unbelievable. Fans Inspirational. The, yeah. Inspirational. And that That's shock it. of black hair, yeah. you know, with the beard and everything. Give me the ball. Give me the ball. Yeah. Take it in and take it straight in on all of them. Um, absolutely inspirational player to, to the actual type of game we played. Yeah. You know, he just give me the ball, I'll settle this up and then get it out of here and then you blokes do what you got to do, you know, type of thing. Yeah. Johnny K a bit the same. Whereas, uh, yeah, as I said, you know, anything happened then. So you sort of – but he was just that inspiration and sort of settle things up if things like, you know, just run into three or four blokes in those days. It was heavy going, I'd imagine. I, I've got to ask too, you touched on you love the SCG. Um almost as much as Belmore. What, why is that? And that was before the grand final win. So what was it about the SCG that you liked? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just got so much history. Mm. And, you know, you go out there and I used to watch the cricket out there and all that. I always wonder what it was like. Because you know now the focus is on the rectangular stadiums and that, you know, yeah, yeah. there's yeah. a lot of dislike and criticism of the SCG because of its distance yeah. from the sides. Yeah. But that's a different argument. As a player, you felt very comfortable. Oh, there. absolutely. And it was a lot easier, I thought, goal kicking out there because you, they were, the crowd was so far away mm. and it, you're pretty much on your own all the time. You know? So that felt good. Oh, absolutely. It yeah. you know, weren't like a Belmore Oval, you sort of, or yeah. Leichhardt and Brookvale in, in those. Games here, you know, the, the, the crowd were obviously really good to me over the years of Belmont. They were amazing. But what about opposing crowds? Oh, a bit hard there. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't be – to go too many steps further back, otherwise you'd get hooked. You know, it's just too – it used to be funny that way, you know. And you yeah. could – not that you'd just be listening or anything, but you could just hear all the rubbish that was coming. And um, and then, yeah, the, the worst thing you could do is if you kick the goal and just, you know, put your finger up at all the crowd. You won't be, I never, ever did that. I just thought – because I'm going to be there again shortly, and you know, you know, I was going to get all the crap anyway. But it's uh, yeah, you ignore that in a way. Go. I uh, we, we've talked about the years after 1980 on the on the show. I want to ask you before we finish, just one more thing. You did a lap of honour in '85 when you'd been to St George and then come back to Canterbury under a very different coach with very different criteria, yep. nowhere near as comfortable, and uh, a very different kind of season. So. I think, in a sense, a lot of Canterbury fans were, were absolutely thrilled that you could do that lap of honour in '85. How, how did it feel for you five years later? Yeah, it was a different. It was a different uh, team and a different club. Like the they'd won the year before, and uh, and I'd been at St George and uh, my time at St George. I had two really good years there, particularly in my own form. I thought was good and all that sort of stuff. Was just one of those things. Mm. But in '85, coming back, you know, I, I I played a fair few games through the course of the year. Uh, Warren Ryan didn't sort of uh, rate me all that much, I suppose. I was I wasn't a defensive type of player, uh, but I I was just doing all my normal things there. But I really didn't have, actually feel part of the '85 sort of team. I played throughout the course of the year, but I didn't actually feel winning the comp that year. I really didn't have a lot to to do there. I was never going to get a run, and as it turned out, I was never going to get a run the next year either because uh, the WAC didn't really, well, didn't like me as a player or whatever it is. I didn't think I was good enough or whatever it might be. But uh, but, that, but that's life, you know. That's mm. that's people's opinions, and, and he'd, he'd won competitions. He can do what he likes, really. Mm. So, you know, and the team itself had sort of changed to a more defence orientated side and a very good side in those two years and spawned a lot of, like it was Terry Lamb's first year in 84, mm. Spawned a lot of blokes that were, were very good players over the next decade, type of thing. So you know, yes, it was just one of those things, you know. So I sort of, you know, it was, it was, it was very much a different story from five years before, put it that way. But uh, yeah, you know that. But that sport, you know, and, and I remember, uh, I remember Dad was saying to me after the uh, the grand final, he said, "Mate, I just." I just don't know whether you're going to top this. This is going to be he's, he's bang on pretty much. And that wasn't a difficult um, comment to make, I suppose. But uh, yeah, it's just nice to remember something well, something good. Oh, it, it well, that particular year was just such a defining year in so yeah. many ways. Um, and uh, and your dad might have been right, but there's a lot of players never even get absolutely to feel that. Do and they? I, so, I think you've got to be very humbled yeah. by the fact that you get a, an opportunity to play. 
mm. and that people give you an opportunity. And I was very fortunate here at the Dogs and at St George. I was given a really good opportunity to try and win another comp um, in those two years. But then coming back here, I, I felt very comfortable when I came back here. But things happen and that's what happened. And, but, you know, history, you know, you, 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 you're part of the history. You're part of the what happened and, uh, and I'm extremely proud of what happened extremely proud of the moment and that's why I always try and treat it whenever I meet someone and so I, I meet someone that they may have been there on that day and I've never met them before so mm. I need to respect that moment and I, I'd, I'd like to know how many times I've, I've responded to the the try and the day but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real massive respect for me when I speak to people about it all because you know I was only, well, even last week, uh, you know, just some random guy come over and said, oh, mate, you're Steve, you're in a, oh, mate, I was, I was in that, you know, that grandstand. Like, I'm, I'm 60, Everyone's been in I'm 66 it. years old. <laughs> and I, was, I'll tell you what, there's got to have been about 2 million people in that grandstand <laughs> that was there. So that's kind of cool. And it's, yeah, look, it's just wonderful to be, you know, you've done something good and something for your community and, yeah, it was, yeah, it was fantastic. It's been great, great ride. Steve Gearan, thanks for being on Bulldogs Unleashed. Pleasure. We'll be back with another episode next week.